Welcome to the Lake Placid uh, Center for the Arts. I'm Joe Martens, as Carlin said. I'm the chair of the Olympic Authority. Uh, I'm the former director of the New York Offshore Wind Alliance and the former commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And uh, I've been around long enough, so I've uh, got the near, I think I'm closing in on the world record for the use of the word former before my title. <laughs> but I'm not gonna bore you with how far back I go. Uh, I live right up the road, about five minutes from here, uh, with my wife Kathleen, and unlike many retired couples who move south, we chose to retire here. We love the Adirondacks, and we love winter, but winter, as we have come to know it over our lifetimes, is changing. Winters are growing shorter, freeze-thaw cycles are becoming more frequent, ice on our lakes and rivers is coming later, and ice out sooner. And everyone who has been here for the last couple of weeks or just over the last 24 hours has witnessed firsthand the wild fluctua fluctuations we're having in temperatures. Species of plants and animals are changing, with invasive species becoming more and more prevalent and problematic, along with harm harmful algal blooms. And while the focus of Save Winter is on winter sports, where the impacts are and will continue to be huge, the consequences of climate change are far far more reaching. They threaten the planet. We're extremely fortunate tonight to have Bill McKibben as our keynote speaker. You can read his bio online, but I just want to give you a condensed version because he is quite an amazing person. He helped found 350.org, the first grassroots global climate campaign, and has organized protests on every continent, every continent, including Antarctica. He's written 20 books, including the eye-opening 1989 book, The End of Nature, which was my first real introduction to climate change. He writes regularly for The New Yorker and a whole host of other periodic periodicals. He lectures all over the world. He's won the Gandhi Peace Prize and the Right Livelihood Award from the Swedish Parliament. Mo most recently, he founded Third Act, which organizes people like me over the age of 60 to take action on climate and justice. The Global Magazine Foreign Policy named Bill to its inaugural list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers. Personally, I would have put him at the top of the list. Bill has and continues to have a huge positive influence around the world and on me personally. It was Bill and a host of, of uh, scientists and activists that helped convince me to ban hydraulic fracturing in New York State in 2015. Thank you. And frankly, it was that finding statement that I signed in 2015 that was the last thing that I wanted to do when I was at DEC, and literally it was the last major order I signed. So please give uh, not only an amazing person, but a very warm person, an amazing communicator, both in writing and as you'll hear, uh, speaking. He's just done an amazing job and he's been an inspiration to me and people around the world. Please welcome Bill McKibben. Well, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that welcome and what a pleasure to be introduced by Joe. Um, who really is. Uh, the, the decision to outlaw fracking in New York was crucial, and it reverberated around the world. Lots of other places followed suit once the Empire State had taken the lead. But of course, that's not all he's done in his career. There aren't that many people who can go to particular places on the map and say, were it not for my efforts, this place would not be preserved and available to all but there are a bunch of places within this blue line where that's true of Joe, and extraordinary thanks for all that work and all that effort over the years. Um, and what a pleasure to get to be part of this symposium with remarkable, remarkable people. First person I saw when I came in the door was Aaron Mayer, and if you haven't gotten to hear him speak, be here tomorrow to listen. He's one of the great prophetic voices that we have 
uh, across the world on environmental stuff and that he happens to be here within the blue line is just our remarkable good luck. I saw Kurt Steger standing by the door, the great climate scientist within this part of the world and one of the great climate scientists in the world, period. And I think Kristen Kimball is coming to talk at some point. Um, um, uh, both a beautiful writer and a remarkable farmer. Mike Richter wrote to me last week to say he was coming. Um, he is a he has as much energy as he did in the net for the Rangers all those years, and, and now he expends it on things of even greater value. So this is a remarkable, remarkable gathering that you put together. I know that some people here aren't from the Adirondacks and have traveled here uh, from around the world for these talks, so welcome to this place. You know it as a temporary spot for the games of this uh, 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 wonderful gathering, but just be aware a little bit that you're in one of the most special places on the planet. Um, the Adirondacks is a kind of um, second chance Eden, a kind of Alaska of redemption, the biggest example in the world of ecological restoration, a place that a hundred years ago was largely cut stem to stern, but now you have to be a good silviculturalist to be in large parts of the park and not know that you're in old growth forest because when the New York State Legislature made the completely unprecedented decision for the time to take a step back here, nature was able to fill that void, and that is a good and promising sign for the world around us. Uh, people, when they come to New York, do not expect to find a vast wilderness here because it's not what New York is most known for. But this place is enormous, bigger than Glacier and Grand Canyon and Yellowstone and Yosemite combined. A great, great, great wilderness that it is our extraordinary privilege to get to try and preserve. And we are doing our best, doing our best to the degree that we can within the blue line, but of course we can't protect it within the blue line alone. There's no way to protect particular places on this planet anymore without protecting the planet as a whole. And that's really what I wanna talk about tonight. Because as Joe said, this place among other things really has always been a layer of winter, uh, a place high up where the cold came early. I can remember 35 and 40 years ago when we used to occasionally get frosts in late August. Um, um, and those days are long gone now, more often now we have nights like last night. It was, it was remarkable to come out of that glorious ceremony at the 1980 rink. Um, after all the hoopla and all the passion and all the great optimism of young athletes gathered from every corner of the earth, and then to walk out onto Main Street in Lake Placid and see the rain pouring down and all those beautiful gold and white lights just reflecting out of the puddles. Uh, 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 and I woke up at seven this morning, the golden arrow, and looked out the window and it was pouring rain still and Mirror Lake had turned into a kind of steel gray sheet of slush and my heart just sank. And then at about 7.45, the rain turned to big fat, lakes of snow and for a moment at least one just felt the great uplift that comes with you know the single most whimsical thing that nature does which is snow down upon us why do we like winter um it's the time when for a period of weeks or months <laughs> Friction loses its remit on planet Earth, you know? Um, 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 
when all of a sudden, even those of us who are normally clumsy and awkward can glide across the surface of the earth, you know? And every single thing that people are here doing at these games, you know, figure skating and bobsledding and Nordic skiing and on and on and on are all completely dependent on that strange physical transformation that allows people to suddenly start sliding where they couldn't before. It's absolutely magical, you know? Um, and it's a magic that is disappearing. And disappearing fast. Um, not just here. Big story in the Times yesterday about how ski resorts across the Alps, where in some ways we learn to do an awful lot of these things, are shutting down one after another this year. They're handing their clients mountain bikes instead of skis and sending them off um, because there is no snow on which to ski. That season that idea is literally melting away around us. There was a study last year of the 21 cities that have hosted the Winter Olympics since they began. And the prediction of the authors of the study was that by mid-century, only four of them would be able to hold the Winter Olympics. One of those four was Lake Placid. And looking at that rain coming down last night, I thought maybe that's even a little optimistic. They said by the end of this century on our current trajectory, the only place of those that will still be able to hold the Olympics is Sapporo, Japan. Um, Shout out to the Japanese team that won the Nordic uh, uh, mixed sprint relay this morning. First race of the games. Um, uh, good to see them, but we do not want to let Hokkaido be the last place on earth where people can go and glide. Um, 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 um. The alternative is just too depressing to imagine. I love every time of the year in this part of the world, but I gotta say, April is, you know, um, uh, and the thought that mud season might just kind of stretch all winter long is about as depressing a thought as I can imagine. Six months of mud would be a blow to the spirit. So those of us who've had the chance to ski up Marcy, or those of us who've had the chance to race at Van Hovenberg, or to camp in the bitter cold underneath the Dixes, or to explore the first ski trails in the country down in North Creek, or, or to skate on black ice in the, uh, when those early days sometimes come in November and it gets cold, or to, or to, explore and snowshoe along the Boreas or the Racket or places. I mean, um, um, it's, it's in our interest, but more it is our duty to try and figure out what we can do. Now, of course, there are much deeper blows that come from climate change than the loss of winter. I'm not going to spend this talk De detailing them all because it would be too sad and because we could spend hours and hours doing it. But let's just use what happened this autumn in Pakistan to kind of remind us of the stakes of what we're talking about. One of the things that happens when you warm the temperature of the earth is that the air can hold more water vapor. Okay, a lot more. That sets up the possibility for rainstorms much greater than we have seen before. Obviously, right now in California, that's what we're dealing with, but the greatest example we've had yet, maybe the greatest rainstorm since Noah came at the end of August and in early September in, in Pakistan. Um, and it just started raining and it didn't stop. And across huge parts of that country, they got within a week or two, 700% of their annual rainfall. Uh, 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 the rain came so hard. I mean, people live mostly in 
houses made of mud that were great, that have often lasted for many generations, but they couldn't stand up to that kind of just day after day after day of beating rain. People's houses literally melted away from them. 33 million people were displaced. That's everybody from Boston down to Baltimore having to get out of their homes and leave. Um, and of course, unlike us, people in Pakistan had essentially done nothing to cause the problem from which they were now suffering. There's uh, 200 million people or so in Pakistan. They've contributed well less than 1% of all the carbon in the atmosphere. The 300 million of us who call ourselves Americans are responsible for about 25% of the greenhouse gas pollution in the atmosphere. The carbon that poured out of the back of my family's Plymouth Fury when I was getting my learner's permit five decades ago is still up there in the atmosphere trapping heat. That stuff lasts hundreds of years in the air. Let's catch up just where we are. So far, human beings have raised the temperature of the Earth something more than one degree Celsius, or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot. It doesn't sound like so much, but think about it in different units. The amount of heat that we trap each day near the planet's surface because of the carbon we've put in the air is the heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized explosions every day. So when you think about it in those terms, it's easier to understand how we've managed to, say, melt more than half of the sea ice in the Arctic, this continent-sized, millennia-old, meters-thick uh, cap of ice now reduced to nothing but slush. Easier to understand how we've managed to already significantly raise the level of the world's oceans, and that raise is accelerating with every month, how we've managed to upend hydrological cycles like the ones we see playing out in Pakistan or in the western US. Look, uh, uh, as I said, warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That means in arid places you get more evaporation and more drought, and then you inevitably get wildfire. Much of the West now is in wildfire season eight, nine, ten months of the year. It's now common for major cities to have to tell people to stay inside for weeks at a time to avoid breathing the smoke in the air. And then the other side of that cycle are these enormous flooding rains that we see. Um, our greatest climatologist, Jim Hansen, uh, the former NASA scientist, the kind of Paul Revere of global warming who first alerted us to this crisis 35 years ago, uh, put out his latest temperature predictions yesterday. Uh, he said that uh, 2023 will probably be one of the warmest years on record, and then 2024, when we're quite likely to see an El Nino cycle in the Pacific, will probably be enough to take the planet at least temporarily over the 1.5 degree temperature increase mark that we've been talking about for a long time. That's very bad news, but the worst news is that we're on a path at the moment, a trajectory that would take us past or near anyway, three degrees Celsius, five, six degrees Fahrenheit increase in the temperature of the Earth. And if we allow that to happen or anything close to it, I think it's fair to say at this point that uh, the consensus is we will not be able to have civilizations like the ones we are used to having. That's simply too much violent chaos and flux in the system for us to be able to cope with. Among other things, the UN estimates that that'll produce between one billion and three billion climate refugees on this planet. Try to imagine that. I mean, uh, uh, 10 million people maybe have fled the Ukraine in the course of this hideous war this year. And that's been enough to strain every ability of Europe to cope. Multiply that by 100 or 300 times and try to imagine what that 
world is like. So, there's plenty of bad news. And I am not going to go on any further delineating it. I'm going to stop. You can stop. We'll both take a breath. And then we will talk about what comes next. Because there is good news too. And much more good news than I would have been able to give you five or ten years ago. I, I, I've been working on this a long time. I wrote the first book about climate change back in 1989 when I was 28. So I've had a lot of time to map the different sort of epochs of this challenge. And we're in some sense in a very lucky one now. Because among other things, over the last decade, the engineers have really done their job. They have dropped the price of clean energy, renewable energy, energy from the sun and the wind, about 90%. And the batteries to store that energy when the sun goes down or the wind dies are on the same plummeting cost curve. That is extraordinarily good news. What it means is that we actually are able to imagine, I wrote a long piece for the New Yorker about this earlier this year, we're actually able to imagine the possibility that in the very near future, humans could end their 700,000 year career of setting stuff on fire. That, <laughs> Darwin said that language and control of fire were the two unique things that really marked our species, that made us so powerful. And indeed, it was a remarkable thing to be able to do. You know, being able to, control fire meant we could cook food, which changed, the, among other things, the size of our brains. It meant we could move north and south away from the equator. The anthropologists think that the social bonds that mark our species were developed at least in part by those millions of nights standing around the campfire talking. You know? um, and then when the Industrial Revolution gave us the ability to control the combustion of coal and gas and oil. It made us rich, it made us modern. That defines the world that we inhabit. All in all, it's been a pretty good habit, but now it is causing us enormous trouble. I've delineated the climate trouble, and that's the worst of it. That's the existential risk. But it's not the only problem. There's at least two other huge things that come with that combustion. One is that it does huge damage to our health. Uh, we finally have good data on this. A big meta study from around the world last year concluded that about nine million people, one death in five on this planet, results from breathing the byproducts of fossil fuel combustion. And if any of you have been to Delhi or Shanghai or whatever in recent years, you have some sense, but it's not confined to those. Go to places in this country where people have to live near the highway or alongside uh, industrial zones or whatever it is, and you get exactly the same response. And the third reason to break this habit of combustion is that we understand, and this past year better than almost ever before, the deep link between fascism and fossil fuel. As long as we rely on energy sources that are only available in a few places around the world, the people who live on top of those places and control those resources will have too much unearned power, which they are highly likely to abuse. Be it the king of Saudi Arabia, be it the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons in this country who used their winnings to deform and degrade our democracy, be it Vladimir Putin, whose blitzkrieg across Ukraine was entirely funded by the fact that he sells huge amounts of oil and gas to the rest of the world. That's all he sells. Go look around your house tonight and try to find something made in Russia that you might boycott in order to show your disdain for his disgusting war on civilians across Ukraine. I wager you won't find a thing unless perhaps there's an old bottle of Stoliknaya someplace in the back of the liquor cabinet. 60% of their export earnings are oil and gas, you know. In a world that relied on sun and wind, those guys would lose most of their power. And the rest of us would gain a certain amount of local control over the one of the most important uh, 
commodities that we possess. So we're on the cusp of being able to do something important and interesting, one of the real hinge moments in the history of our species. But we have to do it fast. That's the thing about climate change. Unlike most of the political problems that we deal with, this one is a timed test. And if we do not get it right fast, then we're never going to get it right. Nobody has a plan for how you're going to freeze the Arctic again once you've melted it. Okay? So it has to happen fast, and it has to happen, I'm sorry to say, over the powerful opposition of the fossil fuel industry. Not only do we have to come overcome inertia, which is always a hard force in human affairs, we have to overcome vested interest and we have to do it quickly. The essential task that we face in this country and in much of the rest of the world is to quickly electrify everything um, so that we can then run everything off clean energy. That's now quite doable in one sense because the technologies are there. Not only do we have the solar panels and the wind turbines, we have the trinity of household products that we can quickly embrace. Instead of the furnace in the basement, we now have the electric heat pump, a beautifully elegant piece of technology that takes the heat from the Air, latent heat in the air around us and uses it to heat and cool our homes. We have uh, the quick advent of electric mobility, uh, electric bikes and electric vehicles of all kinds. These are better than the cars or things that you drove before. Um, so there's no huge sacrifice in going after them. And some of the stuff that it enables are just remarkable. To be able to get on an e-bike and go anywhere, including up steep hills that you couldn't go up before, <laughs> at least if you're a cyclist like me, is a remarkable liberation and one that we should embrace. And then, and I've been thinking about this because it's been in the news all week, uh, the third of that trinity is the um, magnetic induction cooktop for your kitchen. Um, we've had one for years and they work fantastically. And now a lot of other people are going to get them because they're starting to understand why, not just the climate. There was a big study last week that demonstrated that 13% of all the asthma, childhood asthma in the country comes from having to live in a house with a gas cooktop. If you think about it for a moment, it's not so surprising. Basically, we've all gotten used to the idea that we have a campfire in our kitchen over which we make dinner, okay? So it should not be a huge surprise that it's putting stuff in the air that isn't particularly good for us. The good news is it's no longer necessary at all. That's, don't ask me to explain how magnetic induction cooks your food, but it does, okay? Um, because I've been eating it, cooking it, I'm the cook in our house, night after night after night. It works better than what was there before. So this is all doable, but there are 140 million homes in this country. There's about a billion machines that need to be converted, and it has to happen fast. We're beginning to get the policy that could allow us to do that. It was remarkable finally this year in Congress, 34 years and 40 days after Jim Hansen first testified about what he then called the greenhouse effect, to see our Congress finally take action by the skin of its teeth, 50-50 vote broken by Kamala Harris. Um, 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 and it was not an ideal bill because it had to first go through the <laughs> review of Prime Minister Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who cut out most of the really, some of the really important stuff in that legislation. Nonetheless, thanks to extraordinary activism from people around the country, uh, we did finally get this IRA bill, which in effect has a 
bank account of about $8,000 for every home in America to allow them to help make this transition. And we're beginning to see the kind of enabling legislation in states and cities that would allow that to really happen. It was important this week in this state when Governor Hochul in her State of the State address laid out what is really quite a dramatic proposal for a cap and invest scheme that would uh, raise the price of dirty energy, rebate the money, some of the money to people to keep them whole against those rises in prices, and at the same time, give us uh, uh, access to the funding that we need to speed up this transition. We could make this work. We have the technology in order to do much of what we need to do. But the pushback against it is intense and is going to be even more intense because we have an enormous industry, the fossil fuel industry, long the biggest industry on our planet, whose entire business model consists of setting stuff on fire. That is the only thing that they know how to do, and so they will do everything within their power to keep doing it. That is why we have spent the last 30 years not addressing climate change. We had remarkable new paper yesterday from a team of uh, 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 researchers at Harvard and at the Potsdam Institute in Germany, and together they published the most comprehensive findings yet of what the oil industry knew back in the 1980s about climate change. Turns out that scientists in this case at Exxon had studied and made dozens and dozens of careful statistical predictions about how much the planet would warm if Exxon kept doing what it was doing. And when they reanalyzed those data that they've recovered from archives and whistleblowers and things, they found that Exxon scientists were spot on within a tenth of a degree about how much it was going to warm and by when. They knew everything. They knew everything and they believed their own scientists. In the 1980s, Exxon began building all its drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming. The only thing they didn't do was tell the rest of us. Instead, they invested across this industry billions of dollars in building this hierarchy of deception and denial and disinformation that kept us locked in this sterile debate for three decades about whether or not global warming was real. A debate, remember, that both sides knew the answer to at the start, it's just one of them was willing to lie about it. And it became the most consequential lie in human history because it cost us the one thing we needed most, time. It means that we have to do now in five or six years what we could have done over 40 years. And that's why it's going to be so difficult, especially because they continue to get in the way. There was a remarkable story the day before yesterday in the Times from Hiroko Tabuchi, a tremendous reporter. And what she found was that in New York State, uh, fossil fuel industry front groups, the one that she described was the grand eloquently named Propane Energy, uh, Propane Education and Research Council were paying millions of dollars to actors and influencers to get them to make videos and whatever else, trying to convince people that they desperately needed that blue flame to continue burning if they wanted to eat good food and have warm homes. It is, well, it's, it's a crime and it is an ongoing crime. And the power of those industries to keep us from making change is extraordinarily real. The only way to cope with it is to organize, is to build counter movements that come up with enough power to neutralize the weight of industry. And that's what we've been doing now for some years. Great leaders like Aaron and, and others who've been building year after year the kind of national, nationwide and 
worldwide movements that we desperately need, and some of these have been successful. We've had some real victories. We managed to block the Keystone XL pipeline, and thanks to everybody in this room who helped, we've managed to build in this fossil fuel divestment campaign the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at $40 trillion now in endowments and portfolios that have divested in part or in whole from fossil fuel. And it's been extraordinarily helpful. But we have to do much, much more of it to keep this keep alive the possibility that we can meet those targets that physics has set for us. So the question that I want to end with tonight is um, who should be doing this uh, at this point? The people who've been doing it most so far are young people. I started 350.org with seven college students. I was in my 40s, but they were and this was the first attempt, and this was only 15 years ago or so, at a global movement around climate change. And they were remarkable. Uh, there were seven of them. There are seven continents. Each one took one, and they went out to go to work. The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the Internet, you know. And, and they found people <laughs> like themselves, mostly young people around the world, to really... Uh, uh, take on this work and begin to build these movements with a deep focus on justice, often connecting with people in the most vulnerable communities, often connecting with extraordinary leaders in indigenous communities around the world, and building this kind of global movement. Young people have continued to do that work. You know why we have the IRA bill? It's because Kids who worked hard on divestment when they were in college, when they graduated, wanted to keep working. So they formed something called the Sunrise Movement. And out of that Sunrise Movement came this plan for the Green New Deal. Now, when they first enunciated it, they said correctly that we needed $30 trillion to make this happen. It turns out that if you want half a trillion dollars, you better ask for $30 trillion to begin with, because that's what we bargained down. But we wouldn't have anything if they had not done that work. And of course, there are people younger than them doing extraordinary things around the planet. You all know the name Greta Thunberg, and you should. She's one of my favorite people to work with on the planet. I adore her. She is great. And it was the best Christmas gift to watch her take down on Twitter that <laughs> particular moron at the uh, you know, end of the year. Uh, but she would be the first to tell you that you know there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs around the planet and they have 10 million followers. That's how many kids were out on school strike in September of 2019 before the pandemic really kicked in. But I had heard a few too many people say to me, well, this is up to the next generation to deal with this, which seemed ignoble and it also seemed completely impractical because for all their energy and intelligence and idealism, young people lack the structural power to by themselves make the changes that we need to make. Much of that power, and here I'm speaking, if there's anybody else in this room like me over the age of 60, I'm speaking to you, and for the rest of you, tell your grandparents about this. Um, 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 they need some people our age. You know, in this country, there are 70 million people over the age of 60, which is, you know, it's a population bigger than the population of France. And truthfully, in political terms, you can multiply that by quite some large factor because we all vote. There is no known way on earth to stop old people from voting, okay? <laughs> and, and so we have enormous political power and we ended up with most of the resources too. Fair or not, baby boomers and the silent generation above them have about 70% of the country's financial assets compared with about 5% for millennials. So if you wanted to take on Washington or you wanted to take on Wall Street, and I would like to take on both, it helps a lot to have some people with hairlines like mine engaged in this fight. Um, that's why about a year ago, we started building this thing called Third Act for 
progressive organizing for people over the age of 60. And people, when we began, said, ah, this will not work. No one tries to organize older people because people become more conservative as they age. That is the kind of prevailing wisdom. And there's a certain amount of statistical evidence to back it up. Um, people have more to protect, perhaps, so they become a, 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 a little more guarded. But we can't let that be the case. And in fact, we do not need to let it be the case. If you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s now, your first act was in this period of remarkable social and cultural and political transformation that we look back on in the 60s and 70s. Um, um, the period when we started taking women seriously in public life, the apex of the civil rights movement, the birth of the modern environmental movement, Earth Day 1970, 20 million Americans were out in the street, 10% of the then population. And what do you know, it worked within 18 months, not 34 years like we waited on climate change. Within 18 months, we had the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and all the things we still rely on. Um, if you have any doubts about the power of those people in that period, look at what our retrograde Supreme Court went after this past summer on their rampage. They went after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Gun Control Act of 1968, the Clean Air Act of 1971, and Roe v. Wade 1973. They are undoing the things that we created in our first act. And so now one of our jobs is to make sure that people who come after us, our kids and our grandkids, have something like the same kind of world that we were privileged to be born into. It turns out there's lots of people who think this way. This third act thing has grown like topsy over the course of a year, and we've been effective. We had lots of people engaged in the midterm elections. I've just finished a piece that'll be in the Times next week talking about the fact that older Americans did not vote the way that people expected them to in the midterms, which was one of the big reasons that they did not come out quite like the GOP thought that they would. But we're also taking on, and most importantly, climate change in deep ways. And right now, this winter, we're all working hard towards a big day of action on March 21st, 32123, a day too palindromic to ignore, um, um, <laughs> when we're going after the big banks, Chase, City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. The four big American banks are the four biggest lenders to the fossil fuel industry in the world. And we need them to stop lending for the expansion of that industry. So we're going to be outside their bank branches. We're going to be inside their bank branches. There's going to be people cutting up credit cards everywhere, underwater against those dying coral reefs, up against the fire-scarred forests of California. We're going to make as much trouble as we can. And so many people are crowding in to help with this work, like, for instance, the Sierra Club, like many, many others. It's a real joy to watch this kind of mobilization happening because it's what we need. I am not going to tell you that we're going to win this fight because I do not know. There's huge physical momentum now in this Earth climate system and it's going the wrong way. And we have a short time in order to deal with things. All I'm going to tell you is that if we do not fight, then it is a settled affair. And so we need to fight. And we have a sense here, right now this week during these glorious games, of the kind of passage of history, you know. Um, uh, history in Lake Placid is measured in, uh, uh, well, 1932 and 1980. And now 2023, we have these sort of discrete chunks of time that we can look back on and imagine what it was like then. There's people who can remember what it was like then. There are people alive now who can were around for 1932. Um, um, um. Our hope has got to be that if we do all that we can now, 
that 50 years from now, they'll still be able to have this same kind of fun amidst this same kind of beauty. We cannot take that for granted. If we take it for granted, they will not be able to. But if we do everything we can, if we get outside our comfort zone, because the planet is now outside its comfort zone, then we have some hope. So my just plea to you is for all of you to figure out, whatever your age, whatever your predilection, figure out how you can put an oar in here, how you can be part of changing your own house, yes, but the most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual and join together with others in movements big enough to make change. The history of the last century is not just about Olympics and things, it's also about the fact that we were taught from people on the margins, from Gandhi, from the anti, the decolonizers, from Dr. King and the civil rights movement, from the suffragists and the uh, women's movement. We were taught about this extraordinary new invention, the nonviolent social movement that allows people to stand up to concentrated power and make change. That's what has to happen now. Some of us obviously won't be here to see the results. If there's an Olympics here in 50 years, I won't see it, but I love thinking about it and imagining that people yet unborn will be there to slide and to glide and to take advantage of that remarkable, whimsical moment when that phase change happens and water turns into ice and snow and suddenly the world is a very different place. Let's keep that world alive if we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you all enormously. That's, that's kind. Thank you. I rattled on a lot longer than I thought I was. Should have. I got wound up. I apologize. I don't mind at all if you depart to go out into this nice and increasingly cold night, which is a good thing to see. But I, if there's a few minutes, if people have a couple of questions or comments or critique or abuse or whatever you'd like, I think we have, Carlin, with a microphone someplace for people to, to, good, if people have a question, then raise your hand and you'll get a microphone and uh, such thanks. I don't know what it's about. Is it about third act, maybe? Or? Oh, uh, it's too depressing. Let's not show it. We've been depressing enough. Um, what I have is, I'm over here. There you are. <laughs> um, it's not so much a question as a, um, in addition to what you said that Governor Hochul mentioned in her state of a, the state, she also talked about the All Electric Building Act that some of us are trying to get passed. Um, there's a group called Renewable Heat Now that is working to get that legislation passed. And we're going to be in Albany on January 24th. If anybody wants information about that and January wants to come 24th. join us, um, this is huge to this try is to- extremely important. What this talks about is making sure that beginning, I think as early as 2024 or 2025, that any new construction in New York doesn't have a gas hookup to it, because um, you don't need one anymore. And this is a huge part of making this change. Now, in the last week, we've already seen that this is going to be the next thing that the right wing seizes on for its kind of culture war. Uh, and in fact, in the last day, both 
Uh, Congressman Ronnie Jackson of Texas, Trump's chief medical advisor, and um, uh, Matt Gates of Florida have tweeted out that their gas ranges will be removed from their homes once they have been pried from their cold, dead fingers. Um, <laughs> A, a kind of bizarre image for a heating appliance to begin with, but, but, um, and, and the idea of Matt Gates engaging in a lot of cooking seems unlikely to uh, begin with. But at any rate, it, truthfully, no one's even talking about coming into your house and ripping out your gas stove. We're talking about making this transition happen as quickly as we can, which means beginning with new construction and then with replacement when the time comes to get rid of your furnace or get rid of your stove or whatever, that it's replaced with a clean energy electric appliance, with a heat pump, with an induction cooktop, whatever it is. So this is really important work. California's already essentially done this, and New York could play a huge role. New York, it's worth remembering, is the 10th largest economy on planet Earth. It's bigger than South Korea, you know, which is a place we think of as a huge industrial giant. So what happens in New York would make a big difference. And this is a really important place to back up the governor because she's going to be under intense pressure. The fossil fuel industry, as this Times article made clear, is going to pour tens of millions of dollars in. Their theory is if they can drive her approval rating down five or six or seven points in the next month or two, that she will flinch and abandon, and this is a very, I mean, as Joe will tell you, this is the very real things that happen in politics and that one has to stand up to. So thank you very much for doing that work. January 24th, what time in Albany? Are you gonna be where? Good, well, how do people find you to join in? <laughs> um, come see me tonight. There you are. <laughs> Anybody on Najwan yeah. Um You know, there's been a lot of talk about the next big city is for the United States is going to be Park City for the Winter Olympics. But they got a sort of a problem out there, which is called Great Salt Lake drying out. And if that happens, which is likely in the next four years, uh, the consequences are already in terms of dust filled with arsenic and all sorts of heavy metal, you know, coming into one of the fastest growing populations in the country. So my, part of my point is, is that, you know, some of the consequences of not only climate change, but our bad behaviors has phenomenal dire consequences. And climate change is a lot of what's going on in Great Salt Lake. Uh, rainfall is down, water, you know, and as you say, growth in Utah is enormous. And so water use is way up and it's a very dire situation. My dear, dear, old friend Terry Tempest Williams, who wrote the remarkable book Refuge about uh, Great Salt Lake and, the, and its incredible ecology has been sort of keeping me up to date on the just ever, and, and it is a very dire, dire situation. Um, um, and a reminder that this is everywhere that we're dealing with this now. Yeah, great. Uh, hello. Uh so I, I live here, I work for a bank out of Buffalo um, in managing their climate program. And so um, we're engaging in looking at our customers, how do we have that conversation about transition? So we've looked at solar providers, wind providers, kind of traditional energy providers. If you're going to go sit down with someone like that, their whole business model is around the dirty industry how do you kind of have that conversation and stress that importance of the transition and immediacy of that? This is a very difficult conversation. It's, I mean, I, and I do not think, I'll, I'll be honest, I do not think that big oil is capable of making this transition. I do not think that, I think we're past the point. I mean, 35 or 40 years ago, Exxon knew what was going on and they could have made the decision to own the energy future, but they made the decision and maybe a, in the short term, a, uh, a sound financial one to just keep doing what they were doing because they had year after year after year where they made more money than any company in the history of money had made throughout the 1990s and the 2000s. And they're having a good year this year, thanks to Vladimir Putin. But 
but they haven't been doing very well for the last decade, and they won't because uh, going forward, because people have figured out how to provide the same product, energy, cheaper and more cleanly. So in the long run, their lunch is eaten, but the long run doesn't help us very much. Your, your point is correct, that we need to be able to make this transition quickly. So I think that the, one of the ways to do that is to keep emphasizing to everybody else that they better be nimble and quick here because the regulatory environment is coming after them. This, uh, you know, the state of the state address should be a shout out to anybody in New York State. You're, if you want to be making money in anything to do with energy, you better be figuring out how to do it cleanly because that's where New York's going. And I do think that it's worth emphasizing the opportunities that lie there. I mean, this transition is the biggest, going to be the biggest industrial change that we've ever undergone in this country, uh, in this world. And it, the, it's just the sheer amount of capital that's going to be required in order to make it happen and the sheer amount of economic opportunity that that represents is enormous. I should say that it doesn't come for free environmentally either. I mean, it's not as if solar power and wind power and things don't have a certain kind of cost. They do. You got to go mine lithium, say, or cobalt in order to make them happen. And pretty much all mining ends up being destructive and so on and so forth. But as with all things, it's a question of, you know, comparative uh, 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 impact here. And in this case, the the equation's pretty easy if you think about it for a little while. Yeah, you gotta mine lithium to build a battery or a, you know, uh, a cobalt to build a, a wind turbine or something, but you have to mine it once. And once you do, and once you build whatever you're gonna build, there it sits for 25 years or 30 years, and every time the sun rises above the horizon, it delivers that energy. The difference between that and what we do now is when you go mine coal or gas or oil, you just set it on fire and then you have to go mine some more the next day. So the best bet is that the total mining burden on the planet would drop in half or more as we make this transition. One way that I, th I did the work to figure out the number earlier this year, so it really sticks in my head, 40% of all the ship traffic on planet Earth all the shipping on the high seas is just moving coal and oil and gas back and forth around the world. So you get some sense of how you could begin to dematerialize things when you just, when we start just relying on the fact that the, the good Lord was kind enough to hang this large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away and now we have the wit to make full use of it. That is the possibility here and it's a transformative possibility for our species, but also for business people of all kinds. So I guess the advice is get ahead of the curve, not behind it. Because if you don't, uh, hopefully it'll cause you trouble. That's what we're gonna try and make sure anyway. So it's a good question. Allow me to start by saying thank you very much. Um, clearly transition is expensive. Um, so it requires capital expenditure in many cases, especially when it comes to retrofitting and, and changing over energy systems. A lot of that big money will probably have to come from public authorities because they're the ones who can go to the money markets and, and get the money at reasonable rates. How to convince politicians to come up with more projects like the NYPA projects, the decarbonization schemes and so on and so forth, so that all of this can be funded because there does seem to be the demand for retrofitting, but there needs to be the finance that goes with it. So on a federal basis, I don't think we're gonna get any more money soon. I think that the money from the IRA is gonna be for quite a while the high water mark of where we've gone because, you know, at least for the moment, clearly the U.S. Congress is not gonna be providing more. Um, so it's good that there's a lot of money there. 
uh, as much as, depending on how it plays out, $800 billion or so, enough to really jumpstart some of this. But then now it goes down to the state and city level too. That's why this cap and invest program that Governor Hochul's talking about is so interesting. It raises a lot of money by putting, making, you, you know, charging for a, a premium for the combustion of fossil fuel money that gets turned around to do exactly what you're talking about doing. That's the only way to keep nerving up politicians to do this and keep spreading the word. They're all scared at some level because they're going to be accused of raising taxes or whatever it is, and we have to make it possible for them to do that. Um, um, the good news is that the polling makes clear that most people understand the need now for this change and want it to happen. Um, that won't, doesn't mean that there won't be savage ad campaigns and things from the fossil fuel industry to try and keep it from happening, and that in the short term they may have some effect, but we have to keep pushing and pushing hard, and I think we're in a better place to do that than we have been in the past. The zeitgeist, we've sh clearly managed to shift. Uh, uh, the polling data makes clear that people want change now. And the polling data also makes clear that some of this stuff is extremely popular among everyone, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. When we poll stuff, the thing that comes out with the highest level of support across all groups is government support for solar energy. People love solar panels. I think they like them for different reasons. I think sometimes conservatives think, with my panels on my roof, I now, my home is finally completely my fortress and I don't have, and I think liberals are like, well, we're all united by the groovy power of the sun and whatever. That's all fine. We can work with that, you know, that sort of thing is okay. But it's, uh, you know, that's where we've got to keep pushing over and over and over again how important this is. And one of the ways to keep doing it is to just keep reminding ourselves that among other things, this is not only the great practical question of our time, it is the great justice question of our time. Um, you know, when we started this divestment campaign around fossil fuel that's gone on to be this $40 trillion juggernaut, the first person we went to ask about it was Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop of South Africa, because he'd been the linchpin of the first big divestment campaign, which was a crucial part of the South African liberation movement. And Archbishop Tutu, in his wonderful and high-pitched way, said, uh, absolutely do this. Climate change is the human rights question of our time in the way that apartheid was the human rights question of a generation before. And man, was he, you know, put his money where his mouth is, among other things, he made sure that his alma mater, King's College London, divested from fossil fuel early on, and that was a big part of that fight. So uh, that's part of this equation, too. Do we have time for one more question here? Hi, thanks. Um, when it comes to organizing group climate activism, what advice would you have for people, especially young people living in rural areas like Lake Placid where organizing in a meaningful or effective way can be more of a challenge? Well, it's more of a challenge in one sense, but it's actually in other ways, uh, you know, much easier too. I mean, look, five people showing up at the, you know, uh, uh, Lake Placid, you know, at, at, at the council meeting is a lot of people. It's a lot more people than they normally see, you know? <laughs> and, and five young people showing up to say, we, this is something we care deeply about, is gonna be enough to make people at the very least take serious notice about it. You know, we're lucky that we have, I mean, we have, you know, down the road in Ray Brook, we have the APA, which makes policy for the entire park. And they are extremely open to the public because, you know, the public doesn't come in and talk. Usually they only hear from either developers or people who are upset about a particular development someplace. But they don't hear from people all the time who are thinking about the kind of larger 
uh, interest of things, you know? So don't discount for a minute your ability to find a few other people and get to work. Among young people, these sunrise movement hubs that have sprung up around the country often only have five or 10 or 15 people, but they, I mean, this is one of the secrets of, of organizing, you know? Um, um, it seems like such hard work because there's so much apathy that it's hard to get people engaged, right? But, and that's true, and it's bad, and I wish that it wasn't true, but it's always going to be true. Apathy is a um, definite feature of human life. And so the good news is that it cuts both ways. Like, I remember doing the work to organize with friends the first really huge climate march in the country, which was in New York City in 2014, when we had 400,000 people in the street. And it was a hell of a lot of work, you know? And we worried about everything. Was it gonna rain? How many toilets did we need? You know, on and on and on. Um, um, the one thing we didn't worry about was that the next day, 400,000 people would appear marching to demand more fossil fuel, you know? We counted on the fact that, that apathy cut both ways and it cuts much harder in that direction, you know? Yes, the fossil fuel industry is gonna do what it can, but it, doesn't, it does it with money, not with people. So organize the best you can and do it in vivid, funny ways that draw people's attention or sometimes in, uh, in, in poignant ways that draw people's attention. I mean, um, I'm not recommending this to you or saying, because I don't know what you're working on, but for instance, um, I've been to jail now 10 or 12 times, um, which is ridiculous at some level. Like every time, and I bet Aaron, you must think, every time you get a handcuff, it's like, why? Why do we have to go to jail to make our leaders pay attention to physics, you know? This is, there's something absurd about this, but sometimes that's what it does take. And maybe this is a good place to end. This is, this, I'm gonna talk again to my peer group, the old people, okay, like me. This is a particular task that I think older people are particularly suited for. I wrote the letter that asked people to come to Washington at the beginning of this fight over the Keystone Pipeline, which became the first big loss for big oil. We needed to, no one knew about it, so we needed to do civil disobedience to get it on the map. And that's a hard letter to write. Uh, it worked, 1,250 some people went to jail, which was the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in a very long time. But when I wrote it, I said, I do not think that young people should have to be the cannon fodder here on this particular case. They're doing most of the leading, but if you're 19 or 22 or 24 or something, it's possible that an arrest record might not be the best thing for your resume, okay? <laughs> One of the unmixed blessings, one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they gonna do to you, you know? And, and so it, it, was with, um, it was with pleasure that we saw people who, you know, looked as ragged as I do arriving in Washington. We didn't ask people as they were getting arrested, how old are you, because that would be rude, but we did cleverly, I think, say, who was president when you were born? <laughs> and the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet, handle with care. He was old enough that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was, uh, truthfully, I'd kind of forgotten there was a Warren Harding <laughs> administration. It was so good for young people there to see their elders acting the way we actually need elders acting in a working society. So what I'm trying to tell you is, as you're organizing other young people around here, shame some of your elders into coming out and helping too. You will enjoy having them around. They will enjoy being part of it, and it will be a model of how we should be doing this work everywhere, because it's going to take all of us to make this happen. Thank you all enormously.